Well, good morning, class. It's great to see everybody here today. I am uh, off campus this week on uh, house uh, restrictions. My grandson uh, got the COVID and I uh, watch him a couple of days uh, a week. So I've been exposed and I've been, uh, so I will be home this week. Uh, so David asked if he could pop in the office. So I figured I'd just let you all know that I will be unavailable for a pop in this week. I am teaching from my kitchen, but the, the little guy is sick, but he's hanging in there and uh, everyone else is vaccinated. So uh, the outlook is good. Uh, we just don't want to, the college just doesn't want uh, people coming in who've had full exposure and, and endangering other people uh, that may not have been vaccinated. So I will give you full teaching abilities. I just won't be in my office, I'll be in my kitchen. Uh, so it's great to see all of you. And uh, I'd like to begin with uh, just talking about our, our, our future, our future class, uh, because we are wrapping up the first half of the semester this week. So today we will have our last lecture the air sea interaction. That is the last lecture for the midterm exam. Then we're halfway through the material after today. On Thursday, uh, we will review for the upcoming quiz. And then I will hold a question and answer session for all of the material that has been covered uh, up to this point I encourage everybody to uh, do the, uh, or, or at least go over the midterm review that is in the midterm folder. So have a, uh, it's a summarizing everything we've covered and it uh, touches on all of the material on the midterm. So uh, this Thursday, I will make attendance optional, but encouraged because it will be review both for the quiz and for the upcoming midterm exam. Then you're on your own until the 13th. In that time, uh, you will have to turn in the ocean graphing data lab this Wednesday. I also have time uh, for you guys to uh, ask questions about that during the Q&A session you will have to do the current event and quiz three. We will be doing the quiz review on Thursday. And of course the review and the midterm. Please remember that the review for the midterm is due. Please use handwriting. Do not cut and paste answers that uh, bypasses one of the, uh, the learning uh, mechanisms. So for the midterm review, I will expect uh, your best penmanship. I'm not going to grade you on penmanship. Not everyone has great handwriting. Fortunately, I've been teaching uh, for decades. So I've seen some pretty bad handwriting. Don't think you'll surprise me with yours. Uh, just do your best. And uh, I need that and the midterm done by the 13th. So this is our schedule for the next few lessons. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Midterm mid exam, three days, no, uh, four, six, and 10. Well, how about do midterm? The midterm exam is an exam and you have it, you should take it between the sixth and the 11th. Generally speaking, when you meet in a traditional class, you take your tests in class. Being you're taking at home, we will not be meeting online that week. So those are the days you have off for the midterm. So I can pick one day from this period. Come to class this day here. See this day? Okay. That's today. Yes. Log in. Third, or Wednesday, see that's Wednesday. Yes. And then the 13th is the next time we meet in class. 
during that time, all this needs to be done. Okay. I have to one time, one day for, for exam, or I have a free four or five. You have hours. 90 minutes for the exam, unless you have accommodations. If you have accommodations, then you will have whatever extended time periods you have. You have all the time to do the review. Review, okay. The exam is closed book, so don't uh show up and try to use notes or your phone or anything like that it's just you uh for that one can i clarify a question doctor yes yes sir in your remarks a moment ago you said thursday but it should be yes. wednesday you're right you're right and also the question is so it's wednesday morning at 11. okay so the next question is that the, the test, the midterm exam, comprises the chapters one through six. Is that right? I don't have my book handy because I'm at home and it's in the office. So I don't want to misspeak and give you the exact chapters. It's everything we've covered up through today. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I just, uh, this happened over the weekend, a little surprise. So I don't have my textbook home. It's sitting on my desk. But uh it's just up through today she is chapter one through six okay great thank you brian now up through today means we are uh going to have a lesson right now and today's lecture is entitled air and sea interactions air and sea interactions We're gonna start off with what the atmosphere is. Now the atmosphere is layered and it extends up kilometers, but we're really going to just concentrate on the troposphere. The troposphere is the lower atmosphere and it is comprised mainly of nitrogen 78% and oxygen about 21%. The rest of it is uh, variable. And by that, I mean near a city, you'll have a high amount of carbon dioxide. The Gulf where it's warm and we got a lot of water, you'd have a high amount of water vapor and it's all variable. Uh, as you go up in the atmosphere, things get more consistent. Us humans, you know, we tend to make the carbon dioxide and that kind of hangs near the city. But when you go into the upper troposphere, uh, it's generally consistent. So uh, we're looking at the atmosphere the layer of gases around the planet. It's held by Earth's gravity. Uh, at sea level, the pressure is, uh, by definition, one atmosphere as far as um, this, how, how it's measured. That means the weight of one atmosphere is pushing down on you at sea level. Now, if you were to go 10 meters in the ocean, you would two atmospheres because about the uh, 10 meters of seawater equals an atmosphere, which is about 33 feet. So just so you, uh, you know, when you go up a mountain, you're less than an atmosphere because you're above sea level. At sea level, it's one atmosphere. So that's uh, 760 uh, millimeters of mercury uh, or uh, so, uh, when we talk a little bit about meteorology, we, we'll probably uh, talk a little bit about the unit millibars, and that's how uh, meteorologists measure air pressure. So uh, just a, a simple pie chart, you can see here the carbon dioxide, which is so in the news due to um, the greenhouse effect, uh, which we'll discuss. It's a very, very thin slice of what the atmosphere is made of. Water vapor is a thin slice as well. The water vapor only stays in the atmosphere hours, days, uh, to the water cycle. So uh, lower, lower atmosphere, that's the troposphere. It's fairly homogenous. Water vapor can be up to 4% of the volume of the atmosphere, depending on where you are. 
you do know in a desert, you would be uh, far, far smaller, near zero. And of course, over the Gulf on a hot summer day, you may be up around 4%. So the constituents are, are variable. Some of them, like the carbon dioxide and the water vapor. Others, the nitrogen, uh, the oxygen, uh, they've, they're, they're fairly consistent. Uh, I do want to ask someone to everyone to check their mute buttons because there is somebody who I hear a TV uh, going through. So, uh, great. You found it. Thank you so much. Uh, take a look at this image here. I'm going to enlarge it so you can see it. This is called adiabatic heating or cooling. Okay, so on the surface, we have a surface temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, and the air pressure is... Uh, whatever it is, it's holding this air in a parcel about this large. Now, you have uplift. The air will expand because there's less air particles. The further up you go, the air expands. And because it expands, it cools. The air continues to expand and rise. So uplifting of air causes air to expand and cool uplifting, expand, and cool. Now a downdraft, a downdraft causes air to contract and warm. And that is called adiabatic cooling or warming. All right, let's uh, take a closer look at this. What would cause an air to lift? Well, we know hot air rises. So uh, say uplift during the day, the ground heats up, the air heats up, the air gets pushed up. As it gets pushed up, it contracts and cools. So just simple heating process of the surface of the earth would cause it to uh, rise and cool. Another would be your prevailing winds, say coming from the west, hitting those Cascade Mountains in the Pacific Northwest. And obviously if there's a mountain, the air is gonna go up the side of the mountain because it's flowing. It can't go through the mountain. That causes uplift. Anytime you lift air up, it cools. When air cools, it can hold less water. So quickly rising air leads to precipitation. That's why you get a lot of precipitation on the windward side of mountains like Seattle. That's why we get our afternoon thunderstorms here in Florida because all day we're under the hot sun, that air is rising. Eventually there's enough of it cooled that we get our afternoon rainstorms. So low pressure, low pressure is rising air that is expanding and cooling and weather associated with low pressure systems is generally wet. Precipitation, clouds, uh, we're not getting into cold fronts and warm fronts here, but both of those uh, have uplifting air causing different types of weather patterns, but generally speaking, it's raining. So adiabatic processes cause the rain. Now, what would force air down? Uh, well, that same mountain on the other side, the air would flow back down as it flew, uh, flowed over the mountain. It would flow back down and that would cause the air to warm and dry. So that warm, dry air would cause deserts or drier conditions. Uh, say the Santa Ana winds in California spread wildfires. So descending air warms and causes uh, drier conditions. That's called high pressure, obviously. And high pressure systems then bring clear weather. So adiabatic processes can cause precipitation or clear conditions. And the amount of water vapor air holds is dependent on its temperature.
insolation, not insulation, but insolation, I-N-S-O-L-A-T-I-O-N, insolation is an acronym for incoming solar radiation. The angle of insolation determines how strong the sun's rays are. That in turn plays a role in climate. Here at the equator, the insulation is at 90 degrees. This fella here standing on the equator is getting insulation at 90 degrees. That's as powerful sunlight as you can get. So uh, places in low latitudes, meaning the equator or the tropics, have stronger, more direct insulation, incoming solar radiation. Notice here near the Arctic Circle, you have it spread out because it's coming in at an angle. Also, a lot of the light bounces off as a deflection and reflection because it's not as direct. It doesn't travel through as easily. So this gentleman here would be standing in a colder climate because it has an angle of insulation not 90 degrees, less than 90 degrees, the less it gets, the less powerful that sun ray is. Although it's the same strength solar beam, it has less powerful of effect. It's more diffuse on this Earth's curvature. So where you are, a lot of that has to do with climate, and that's because of the angle of insulation. Ice plays a role as well. Ice reflects more energy. That's called Earth's albedo, A-L-B-E-D-O, albedo. So the amount of solar heat varies with latitude. Of course now, if this were the case, water would eventually heat up and boil off the equator and freeze off the poles and the earth would not be livable. But uh, we go around the sun and our angle toward the sun changes. Also, we have global winds, convection cells forming from the uneven heating of the earth those global winds cause ocean currents. Ocean currents flow, and so they're, they're, they're flowing in what we call gyras. The gyras are circular ocean currents. The Gulf Stream, North Atlantic, Canary Current, Equatorial Current is our northern gyra. I'm tracing it out with the cursor. This distributes warm water toward the north, cold water toward the south, and moderates world climate. So all of these systems working together allow Earth to be livable, allow water to exist in all three states, and uh, stop this from just freezing and boiling away. So it moderates climate, Earth is livable, water exists in three states because of this energy transport. The energy is transported by the global winds and ocean currents. So the uneven heating of the earth causes the um, solar winds and ocean currents, surface currents, and the Coriolis effect uh, helps steer them. Now, Coriolis effect uh, was named after a uh, scientist named uh, Gaspar D. Coriolis, and he uh, determined that if you fire a cannon ball a great distance, let's say you're here, and I'm going to exaggerate, and I'm trying to hit here, Greece. 
and I'm standing in the middle of Africa and I have this superpower cannon and I'm gonna shoot it directly north at Greece. When it's in midair, what's gonna happen is the earth's gonna turn underneath it and you're gonna miss Greece and you're gonna land it in Italy. So everything deflects because of earth spinning. That's the Coriolis effect. So how does, when, what was that now? How does that, I forget what it's called, but you know how if you're on a skateboard and you're tossing a ball up and down, the ball will still land in your hand. How is that, um, how, how does the Coriolis effect with that was, because I just assumed that that didn't apply to earth spinning. Well, it does, but you're only shooting it up like, uh, like uh, six inches, a foot, and earth is not gonna, uh, you know, and the time it takes for that, Earth's not going to move enough. It might be like a millimeter off, less than a millimeter off with you. But if you were to shoot it up an airplane, uh, you would turn underneath it and it would miss you. That's why uh, you know, people that fly, when you're flying west, it takes, you know, takes a different time. Flying east, flying due north, you have to make a correction for the Earth spinning. Mm -hmm. a, a ball thrown up from a skateboard wouldn't give it enough time for it to actually... Uh, move that much okay thanks but that's a that's a good question and we are spinning fast but we're awful small and that distance is only a couple of feet that you throw it up presumably uh, you know so it's really not gonna give you that big of a variation but the Croyos effect is why i was spinning naming the currents and you'll have to name a few currents uh, our north atlantic gyra a gyra gyroscope g-y-r-e is like a spinning moving and all the oceans have this spinning moving gyra in it and it spins because of the Coriolis effect and hurricanes you know they spin they spin because of the Coriolis effect uh the Coriolis effect causes whirlpools to occur uh because the earth is spinning so uh, the Coriolis effect is, is that. It doesn't power the currents. The uneven heating of the earth powers the currents. It more steers them. Uh, David asked me about this today. The reason we have the seasons is what we call earth's obliquity. Obliquity means axial tilt. Here's the sun, not drawn to scale, obviously, and the earth going around the sun. Our axial tilt of 23 and a half degrees remains unchanged as we go around the sun. So if we start here on winter solstice, you can see the southern hemisphere leans toward the sun, meaning they get direct insulation and the solar disk lit, they have more hours of sunlight because if you draw the lit half, far more of it resides in the Southern hemisphere than in the Northern hemisphere. So the Earth's obliquity here, axial tilt, would lend longer days in the Southern hemisphere, greater direct sunlight, the sun would be directly overhead if you were to stand on the Tropic of Cancer at noon, 23 and a half degrees south latitude. The sun's directly overhead. Here, we're leaning away from the sun and we have shorter days. By drawing an imaginary line here, the dark half, you would see near the poles, you would be in perpetual darkness. Here near the pole, you would be in sunlight all the time. Now, of course, that is a very low angle insulation, so it wouldn't be very hot toward the poles, but you would have sunlight the whole time. So this would be the first day of winter in the Northern Hemisphere. It's called winter solstice. That is when the sun is furthest in the Southern hemisphere, apparently. Shortest days, 
and least direct sunlight. As you move toward spring, the days tend to get a little longer, a little longer, a little longer, a little longer until boom, you're here at the equinox. Equinox, the sun is directly over the equator and everywhere on the planet has 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness in the 24 hour period. That's equinox. That is also the first day of spring. As you move, the days get longer, 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 longer. Maximum apex in the Northern Hemisphere. You are standing right on the Tropic of Cancer and the sun is directly overhead. I believe I said Cancer, I should have said Capricorn uh, here for winter, but, and then the sun is directly overhead. You have the longest hours of daylight in the Northern Hemisphere. That is the first day of summer. And we call that summer solstice. Moving through, you get to another equinox and that is uh, autumnal equinox or the first day of fall. So the reason for the seasons is Earth's obliquity, 23.5% and our trip around the sun. The longest day of the year is summer solstice, which is usually June 21st or 22nd. The shortest day of the year is winter solstice, December 21st or 22nd. The first day of the astrological year, astronomical year, would be <laughs> vernal equinox, March 21st or 22nd. And autumnal equinox is the other equinox, which is September, which just happened. We just had fall. Now, it's fall officially. Why is it so darn hot in Florida? Well, the whole planet uh, has a little time lag because the sun's still pretty high in the sky uh, on uh, you know, the, the day after equi or solstice, still pretty high. So we continue to heat up until August. Then we cross the threshold and start to cool down. And we continue to cool down until February. Then we start to heat up again. So really, February is probably the coldest month. And August is the hottest month, although the equinoxes and solstices do not fall in those months because there's a little bit of a time lag. Question, Doc. Yes, sir. Could you just tell me um, if the longest day is a certain number of hours, let's just say in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, what would be the number of hours for that and compared to the equinox, how many hours of daylight? Every place on Earth has 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime on the equinox. Oh, 12 to, yeah, that's at the equinox. Thank yes. you. Because it's equal, equinox means equal night. And I got one other question. Sure. Would you, would you go back to the, um, to the uh, Caroli effect? Coriolis, I'm, I'm going to uh, speak on it again in a little bit. Oh, so we'll, uh, press forward. And if I don't address your question, um, hang on to it and then we'll handle it at the end. Thank you. No problem. All right. So this is what I meant when I said hours of daylight vary. Here is the lit part of the earth. Here is the 23 and a half axis. We move 15 degrees per hour rotationally, which means the sun looks like it moves 15 degrees per hour. It's really us. And so over a 24 hour period right here, you have more night than day because you're only moving 15 degrees per hour. More day than night. 
At the equator, take note, you always have 12 hours and 12 hours. So the equator has equal day and equal night, but only on equinoxes do, uh, does the rest of the world line up with that. So the length of day depends on where we are in our trip around the sun. Now convection, and this example of convection in a room happens the same way. Anything that is considered a fluid transfers energy via convection. Gases like the atmosphere, convection. Water, which is a fluid, convection. The mantle, which is a solid, but it has the ability to flow, convection. Fluid just means the ability to flow. We mistakenly apply fluids only to liquids, but really gases are fluids and some solids are fluid as well. So because of thermal expansion, less dense rises, cools, thermal contraction sinks, and you get convection. That's the same convection in this room that causes air to rise and fall, giving us global winds, that cause uh, density currents in the ocean, which gives us our thermal haline circulation, which cause mantle convection, which gives us plate movements. So convection is the driving force for winds and ultimately ocean currents because the global winds push our ocean currents. Thermal haline circulation, which we covered last class, and plate tectonics, which we've looked at as well. So convection is a very important concept in the earth sciences. Now there's Gasper D. Coriolis. And we're looking at the Coriolis effect. <clears throat> Again, because the earth is spinning, fluids flow in curved paths. Everything moves to the right in the Northern Hemisphere and to the left in the Southern Hemisphere, as far as the curve due to Coriolis effect. Now, that means that a low pressure system spins counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. That's why hurricanes, which are low pressure systems, spin counterclockwise. A high pressure system spins clockwise. That's why the ocean gyras, which this is a center of high pressure on our planet, spin in that direction. So low pressure has a counter, a counter clockwise spin. High pressure has a clockwise spin in the Northern hemisphere. In the Southern hemisphere, it is opposite. Okay, so air turns to the right in the Northern hemisphere. Air turns to the left in the Southern hemisphere. Now the Coriolis effect does not drive wind and water currents, it steers wind and water currents. David, you wanted to chime in on the Coriolis effect now? All right, well, if you have, a, if, if I didn't cover your question, please ask at the end then. I had a question about this actually. Okay, uh, I don't, you didn't pop up on my screen. Who am I speaking with? Oh, this is Artesia. Oh, hi, Artesia. Hello. So does this have to do with um, the, I don't know if it's true or not, but the saying that like in Australia and stuff like that, the toilets flush a different direction? That is been disproven on Mythbusters, but only yeah. because uh, it's not a uh, it, it, it's not uh, a natural flow of the toilets. They kind of are pumped that way, but it is why storms spin in the opposite direction in Australia and right. whirlpools spin in the opposite direction and the global winds 
are turning in the opposite direction. It's just that toilets, uh, the jets are facing that way. Although, you know, I, I mean, I've never been to Australia, but I watched the episode because I believed that until I watched the episode. And I always thought toilets went straight down at the equator too, but, you know, oh. uh, they ruined everything. <laughs> But that's just the way our toilets are designed. But it's why whirlpools and eddies and stuff like that spin oppositely. Right. Thanks. So this image is our global airflow. Let's have a look at it. Now, remember, uneven heating of the Earth causes air to rise due to expansion and cool, and we have convection cells. The Tropical convection cells are called Hadley cells. Here, you have the area of rising. That is a low pressure belt, L. I could draw a big L right there. Now that low pressure belt doesn't have any wind. It's called the doldrums. The old sailors used to call it the doldrums because if you got stuck in the doldrums, you would uh, not be able to go anywhere for days months, ships even died, mutiny, ghost ships, because you would be stranded, no wind, and, um, you know, sailboats need wind. Those huge ships needed wind back before there was uh, energy powered. So the doldrums are narrow band at the equator where the air is rising. Also, because it's a low pressure belt, that's where you have the majority of rainfall. So the oceans are less saline at the equator, less salty because of the rain. Rainforests tend to form near the uh, low pressure belt, that uh, equatorial trough, low pressure belt, or ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. And you have your tropical cell. Because of Croyol's effect, it is steered and it goes at a diagonal. If it were, uh, if the earth wasn't spinning, it would just be north-south flow. But we are blowing a little bit toward, now if you face it, it is toward the right. These are called the trade winds. The trade winds are blowing near the equator a little bit towards the right and left in the Southern Hemisphere. You can see sitting here, that's pointing to the left. And then if you were to face this, turn oppositely, that would be pointing to the right. So the Northeast and Southeast trade winds blow between, now this is just idealized, it's tilted. In the summer, this would be a little bit wider. In the winter, it would be a little more narrow. But on average, between 30 degrees and the equator, the trade winds are blowing, and that's where we have our weather moving. So your hurricane starts here in the Atlantic, hot water, and it's moving because of the trade winds and the equatorial current, which happen to be blown by the trade winds. And then when you have interference with the land and the Gulf Stream starts to turn up, that hurricane turns up or if it enters the Gulf, it follows the loop current and turns up. So weather systems move across the Atlantic near the equator on both sides on these equatorial currents, which are being blown by the trade winds. Now here, you're having that cool air descending. That's a high pressure belt. It happens to fall on average, 30, again, moving seasonally. That's also called the horse latitude. That's this ancient, like the doldrums is an ancient seafarer word. The horse latitudes were, uh, you know, descending air, so there's not much wind. And so you had to lighten your ships to catch whatever little wind there was, so you threw things overboard. The first things you'd throw overboard were the horses because they were heavy. You keep the cannons because you might run into pirates who need to fight, but you throw the horses over first, and then you probably throw some of your shipmates over before you throw the can cannons. But uh, that's called the horse latitudes. Uh, 
Seriously though, this area of high pressure is very dry, meaning this is the saltier area of the ocean right here. And like I said, gyros are centered around high pressure. There's your high pressure belt. Your Gulf Stream moves up, then it goes across North Atlantic, then down Canary, then across Equatorial. So the center of it is a high pressure system. That's the driving force of the uh, driving force of the uh, currents. So you're having your airflow blow across from the west. There it is from the west, and those are called the westerlies. So here in the United States, that 30 degrees actually, it's not quite drawn to scale because we're at 28 degrees here in Tampa. So really, we're really close to that, at that uh, belt. You go up just a little bit, but all weather systems move from west to east across the United States, riding these westerlies. The, the uh, high pressure, subtropical high pressure belt has the subtropical jet stream. The polar jet stream or the polar vortex is between the polar cells, which is found at the pole, and the mid latitude cells, which are called the feral cells. More convection. Here is another low pressure belt very dry, you have ice, but you don't get a lot of snow or uh, precipitation at the 60 degree point in both hemispheres. But really the ones we concentrate on in this class are the trades and the westerlies because those are the ones that steer our ocean currents. So surface currents are wind driven and these are the winds that drive them. Weather systems move around the world on these winds as well. So this is a key concept for oceanography and meteorology. A little simpler two-dimensional drawing is here. Notice uh, you have, this is just the surface, so you're not getting the three dimensions, it's a little easier to follow. You can see these are moving to the west with a little northern spin. These are moving to the uh, east with a northern spin or with a southern spin, pardon me. And that's because of the convection cells and Coriolis effect. The easterlies. There's your horse latitude. There's your equatorial doldrums. High pressure, low pressure, Low pressure, so you get a lot of precipitation, not much. This is just a uh, little simpler diagram. The names of the cells, the Hadley cell, the Farrell cell, and the Polar cell. You have two Hadleys, one on each side of the equator, two Farrells, both of them are subtropical, Tropical, subtropical, polar cells. The doldrums, also called the ITCZ, they can be as narrow as 20 miles or as wide as 300 miles. They're areas with very little wind and dense clouds, a lot of rain. The trade winds push the equatorial currents. They were named trade winds because that's what was used to travel across oceans from Europe, across the Atlantic, or while well, we didn't really travel from uh, these, the Pacific this way, but from Europe across the Atlantic to the New World, those were the trade winds. The horse latitudes were those subtropical latitudes where that high pressure ridge is, meaning ships would uh, sit up a little higher. And uh, to do that, they would throw heavy things overboard if they got stuck in them. That's how they got their name, horse latitudes. 
the westerlies move weather systems across our country, not as much in the southern hemisphere. You can see uh, the northern hemisphere has far more land than the southern hemisphere. So the westerlies are predominantly the weather movers in the northern hemisphere. And then the polar easterlies are up along the uh, they, they're, you know, not many people live in the polar easterly belt in the northern hemisphere. You have the ice cap in the southern hemisphere. You have Antarctica. So this slide summarizes each of the wind belts. This would be a good one to review. I've heard the term monsoon a lot. And monsoon is a weather pattern, not a rainstorm. It includes a rainstorm, but it's not a rainstorm. Here's your monsoon, okay? Like I said, over water, over land, you have different heating. So your doldrums are uh, not exactly at the equator, but here's your, your doldrums. And notice here's your airflow in uh, the winter when the equator is uh, the uh, doldrums are hanging a little bit low, you get a lot of wind being sucked over out of the uh, Asia into India. And it's very dry, very cold wind. Because it's so dry and cold, you have frigid weather, very little precipitation. The opposite is true in the summer where the ITCZ sits above the equator and what you're getting is the air being sucked off the Indian Ocean and hitting southern India. That is very warm and it rains constantly. As a matter of fact, you get more rain than your average rainforest, more than 10 meters a year but you get that in six months. That's why the term monsoon is applied to incredible torrential rain. It really originates from seasonal rain. A monsoon is seasonal rain. You also have seasonal chill. So monsoon comes from the Arabic term maism, which means season. So monsoon does not really mean torrential rain, although we colloquialized it in America. Uh, it means seasonal. And that is the monsoons that occur. Here, locally, this is what we get all summer, most of fall, most of spring. All day, our land warms up and the air rises. And then that pulls our moist Gulf air up with it, condensation occurs, and you get your afternoon thunderstorms. You go to the beach, you're constantly getting a breeze off of the Gulf. In the afternoon, you constantly get thunderstorms. And they don't happen everywhere, but they happen every day. Somewhere in the area, you are going to have thunderstorms. So, and you don't necessarily have them right on the beach. So when you, you, they're a little bit inland because that's where your sea breeze has built up that warm air that cools, moistens rain. At night, the opposite occurs. You don't necessarily get rain offshore, but the land cools down a lot quicker and you get a little bit of a breeze and you get cloud cover and haze covering the Gulf at night. So sea breezes is what gives us our afternoon storms and land breezes give us cloud cover over a body of water in the evening. Low pressure systems are storms. Here's a super low pressure system. Uh, tornadoes, what causes a tornado you say? Uh, you have to have flat. So you have hundreds of miles, you have a low pressure system which pulls air up and that air can suck in from 100 miles to that low pressure system. As it's moving, it's picking up speed, hits the low pressure system, 
pulls up and that makes the low pressure system strong and then stronger because it, it's flat, it heats up, sucks air from all around and Coriolis effect gives us this uh, rotation. The stronger the low pressure system, the more chance you have for funnel clouds to occur. So we get water spouts more often than funnel clouds in Florida. We do get some funnel clouds in Florida and some tornadoes, generally spinoffs of hurricanes, but we can get a water spout all the time because our gulf is warm and it's flat. So you need to have a large flat area and an area that builds up low pressure in the hot sun all day. And then you have a chance for a tornado to form. More often than not, though, you just have thunderstorms because the uplift isn't violent enough to spin, to give you that, that, that spin, the, the, the cyclonic spin, it's called. Thunderstorms now, all that distance, you're picking up ions, 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 that air is uplifted quickly and it discharges a spark. It's not much different from me walking around uh, sliding my feet on carpet with socks and then touching something and getting a little shocker. Uh, of course, you know, me doing that and a little finger gives a little shock. A air mass uh, doing it for miles and miles, uh, sucking up discharges ions a lot greater than uh, a guy with a pair of socks. So you know the result is lightning. Now, Pinellas County was once known as the lightning capital of the world because we get all those afternoon thunderstorms, we get that moist air moving fast, it rises fast, and so we have lightning storms and thunderstorms that occur here almost every afternoon until it cools off. It cools off, you don't get severe low pressure and the severe updraft that it takes to cause a thunderstorm. Tropical cyclones occur when, oh, let's see if I have another picture. Uh, uh, I wanna, no, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pop up. I apologize, I wanna pop up to a picture. Let's take a look at, use this. Okay, generally speaking, here on our trade winds, uh, let's just start right here. You get, the hot, warm air coming off the Sahara, dry moisture, and you get some uplift. And so you got what we call a tropical wave. This tropical wave, it's a little low pressure system, and it's pulling the, it starts off dry and it's pulling moisture off. So you're right here, and you're just a little low pressure system, your wave. You move a little more here, and the air is moving faster, you're getting more moist air, and then you get yourself uh, maybe a depression. Then you move, you keep moving this way on the trade winds, but you're continuing to get that warm, moist air building up. So from a depression, you get a tropical storm. And then you move a little more and you're continuing to get that warm, moist air. So now from a tropical storm, you can turn to a cat one hurricane and you keep going and growing on the trade winds until you hit the westerlies. When you hit the westerlies, you make your turn. You can make your turn before you make landfall and just fizzle out the ocean. You can make your turn here and hit anywhere. We had one a few years ago turn and hit New York City. A lot of times you just hit plop right into here somewhere, anywhere between Hatteras and Miami Beach. If you're a little lower, you, know, you don't form at this latitude, you form at this latitude, you might even enter the Gulf and ride the loop, hit Louisiana, or go straight into Texas, or curl and hit Florida. Uh, so that is why this area is hurricane breeding grounds in the summer. You have uh, warmer water, and that warm water feeds the low pressure and encourages the updraft, which makes the pressure lower and lower and lower. So here, here you have your hurricanes enter the Gulf and it intensifies because the Gulf's really warm. 
And of course, you now are making that upturn because in the Gulf, you have what's called the loop current. The current goes like this. Drawn in by the trade winds, moves up and enters those westerlies. So your storm follows suit and will hit Louisiana, the panhandle, or if it's a little lower, might even hit right into Texas. But the storm, you know you get bands. This is how the storm looks like a cross-section of it. Your low pressure system is centered over the eye where you have updraft, that's why it's clear, just like pure updraft all around it, you're getting Coriolis effect, giving it its counterclockwise spin and the rain forms bands as it moves in. That's all moving trade winds, westerlies. So this is how it moves, Gulf Stream, or equatorial Gulf Stream. So you get that big turn. And that big turn uh, is associated with ocean currents and global winds. So cyclonic flow is right here, right around counterclockwise around your low pressure system. That is how a hurricane forms. Now we've all heard, here's the different wind speeds. Uh, below that, you could have a tropical wave less than 38 miles an hour or 62 kilometers per hour is a, above that it's a tropical depression. You are a tropical storm and then your hurricane speeds. This is called the Buford wind speed classification system. The Buford wind speed classification system. So here's our breeding grounds for hurricanes and typhoons, which are the same as hurricanes, different terminology because of a different spin. When you reach the middle latitudes, the, air, the water is not as warm, so hurricanes fizzle. When you hit land, you no longer have the water feel it feeding the hurricane and they fizzle as well. So our storm tracks are riding the trade winds and then curving up due to the loop current, upstream westerly winds. So in the North hemisphere, tropical cyclones are hurricanes and they are counterclockwise. In the Southern Hemisphere, we call them typhoons and they are clockwise. Our main weather makers that aren't hurricanes are called mid-latitude lows. If I were to draw a line right here, this is continental polar, maritime tropical air, and this is warm, moist air. This would be a little bit cooler and you would have a front where the air masses meet. So our low pressure system causing spin, causing counterclockwise spin, we have warm air pushing cool air. There's your warm front. You have cool air pushing warm air. That's your cold front. So weather in the Americas is caused by what we call the mid-latitude low or mid-latitude cyclone or extra tropical cyclone. They're all synonyms. There are a series of warm fronts and cold fronts between warm, moist Gulf and Atlantic air that meets cooler Canadian, Northern United States air. And the low pressure system, which generally forms here, spins it. So a mid-latitude low, this is what it looks like on the Doppler radar, looks like a comma, and they can occur here where cool air meets warm air. In this case, this is the West Coast. In this case, this is the East Coast. But that's our main weather maker in North America. 
and they move on the westerlies across the United States. Well, congratulations, class. You have finished the first half of oceanography. I hope you enjoyed it. I would like to have any questions if I could at this time. Um, I had a couple of questions. This is Artesia. All right, Artesia, you came up now, so that's good. Nice. So um, not probably the most relevant, but do we know why, um, and you might've covered this already, do we know why Earth spins like that? Like how, you know, how it spins, not, sorry. I know because of gravity, like it rotates around the sun, but do we know why it, why it revolves? Like how the moon always has the same face facing the earth? Like why doesn't the earth have a face facing the sun? The moon is caught in uh, our gravitational field, which is tractive. Uh, like, uh, so it's caught in our gravity, but it's really gravity and momentum. Uh, gravity and momentum uh, cause the spin and not just gravity. We go around the sun, but momentum or inertia, which is the same conservation of momentum states, a body in motion stays in motion, like acted on with another force. So, uh, the momentum keeps us moving in that circular path. Gravity, we would just slam into it. So it's the combination of gravity and momentum. Uh, let me uh, show you, uh, something here. Let's just put two bodies and I'll draw gravity. So they're going to slam into each other, right? Because of gravity. Now this drawing, you have two forces, but when you add two forces up in physics, you have to put your vectors tip to tail. And so your resultant, your resultant is there. Okay, now do and we know that why? resultant is at an angle. So that's what causes all motion. It's not quite a circle. It causes all motion and spin because when you add forces, you have to add more than numbers. You have to add direction as well. And you don't add them up uh, the same way you would add up numbers. The force vectors actually work tip to tail, or you would use trigonometry. And that's what causes angular motion and spin. Okay. So it's all physics. It's way beyond the scope of this course, but it's just, it's just physics. Well, so that part makes sense to me, but you know how like we have the day night cycle because earth is rotating, mm -hmm. but the moon doesn't have the day night cycle, right? It's always has the same face. Well, basically. no, it does have day night cycle because it okay. goes around the sun. Oh. oh, okay. Sorry. So I meant that the earth is always seeing the same face of the moon from the earth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it's trapped in our gravity. Do we know why that doesn't happen for the earth to the sun? Like why the same face of earth isn't always facing the sun? Well, if we, because we're a lot bigger, so we, our mass is strong enough to overcome that tractive force, but it's slowing down. If you forward a fast uh, 500 million, 500 billion, however many years, eventually we would be caught in the tractive force. All right, thanks. We're also a lot, the moon is a lot closer, but yeah, our days are actually getting shorter and shorter seconds every year, milliseconds, but eventually we would be caught in the same tractive force. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question at first, but I, I think I got it that time. We just haven't got to that equilibrium yet. Okay, cool, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We won't be around when we do either. Hey, Professor, I got a question. This is Jalen. Hey, Jalen. Yeah, uh, this is about the, the exam review. Okay. Is it okay we can like please just do it on our computer, like type it? And then copy it by hand. Yes. I don't care how you do it, but you have to turn in a handwritten copy. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I uh 
took a lot of educational psychology and stuff. And I do, I do know that the, how the brain works and when you're writing and you're reading it, you're saying it in your head and really it's more effective studying than copying, pasting or pushing buttons. So I just, anything I can do to ensure your success, uh, I will do that. Yes. Yes. All right. I see, uh, Maria, I see you unmuted. Are you ready? Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> when, um, when we do quiz number three. Oh, I just went through that at the beginning of class. If you want to stay after class, I'll reinforce that with you. I don't have dates right in front of my, my face right now, so I'm going to have to log into a different screen. So just hang out real quick after I dismiss class, and I'll go over the schedule with you again, okay? I, yeah, or you can send me mail or some... Uh... Well, I would rather just make sure we're on the same page before I dismiss you. Okay, what I do now... I so do just... Well? Just wait, wait a minute and okay. let me, okay, let me finish you. all the questions. And then after I say class dismissed, I'll pop on there for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. David, did you have a, a question? Did I cover your yeah, yeah. Uh, Coriolis effects? Well, no, let me go back to the um, number of hours in each day. I think that was slide seven or something, seven or eight. Okay. Uh, question, sir. You have the slide to present? Oh, I have to log in and, and re get oh, it. Hold no, on. okay. Here's the it's question. Not a big deal. Let me okay, see if I can find it for you. No, I think you could answer without the slide. So, okay. just to summarize, you said equinox, it's equal number of hours in the day and the night. Yeah, the whole world gets 12 hours day, 12 hours night. And the next phrase or next comment you made was that the equator, the day and the nights, Hours stay are equal. equal. Yeah, they stay so, equal. So that means you got 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night at the equator year round? Yes. Okay, I have to process that, but that clarifies it. It's year round. So arguably at the equinox, it's only during that short period of time when you have the equinox. That is, and then that's 12 and 12. That's what it we would have 12 and 12. Uh, Nova Scotia would have 12 and 12. Uh, Australia would have 12 and 12. The whole world, because we're even with the sun, our axial tilt lines up with the sun exactly. Okay, so now I got, so that clarifies that. Now, could you go to the Coriolis questions? Um, I think it's slide number, well, without the slides. You, you illustrated the, the, you talked about rotation. You, you talked about counterclockwise in the Norman, Northern Hemisphere. Around a low pressure system, we are counterclockwise, yeah. yeah. But then the arrow in some of these slides, if for example, I, I looked at- um, That would be around of, a high pressure system if, Okay, let's just look at this. See this little image right there? I drew an F and then straight arrows towards it. Yeah. Everything moves to the right. So I'm going to draw my arrows pointing to the right. See how those arrows are tilting to the right now? This yeah. Way. So that means my net flow is counterclockwise around a low. Now let's do a similar thing for a high pressure system. First, well, those, th those arrows are pointing, arrowing toward, toward the left as I'm facing the screen. No, you have to, they're all to the right. This one, well, the, the, the screen's opposite because I hand drew it. Oh. Well, I think, I think the point is that from the um, perspective of each of the arrows, instead of being straight, it is going right. Well, yeah, you have to face the arrow. The arrow's moving in this direction. And then okay, the arrow's moving in this direction, but it's always moving to your right in the direction that you face. Well, now, if that's the case, then that would, to me, that would argue toward a clockwise move, movement 
rather than counterclockwise. You uh, see this? There's your high. I moved everything to the right. And that gives me a clockwise movement around a high. Oh. Movement around oh. a high, counterclockwise around a low. Oh, that's going to help. I got to I got to process that. Yeah. Just uh, and, counterclockwise around a low pressure system, clockwise around a high pressure system. And finally, the, the term westerly means the origin of the wind is coming from the west, but it's going toward the east. Correct. Winds are always named from where they originate, not where they are moving to. Yeah, that gives me a little wrinkle in my thought process. Okay, thank you. That's what I have. No problem. We're going to have a big Q&A on Thursday, so we will certainly address any questions as well. That gives you a couple of days to digest it. And that's Wednesday. That's Wednesday. Isn't Wednesday. It? Yeah, I get my days mixed up. My apologies. It is Wednesday. When we Thank know. You. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why I'm in a time warp today, but uh, but I am. But next class we are going to have a Q and A, and hopefully we can spend much of the class doing what we're doing now, kind of having an open discussion and ironing out all the wrinkles, so to speak. So. Is there anyone besides Maria that needs uh, to clarify anything? Because I'm going to dismiss class then, and then I'm going to break up, uh, break out the the calendar and help uh, Maria get her uh, planner written out. So, uh, any other questions? Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, no problem. Have a great one, uh, Maria. Do you have a sheet of paper or a little calendar? Or something? Yes. Yes, sure. I have everything. All right. Let me bring up the dates for you. And here. Yes, it says do it. Do it to do work is six. due. Yeah. The sixth. Current events and quiz three is due the sixth. Yeah, but when it starts, I can do no, it. No, that's when you have more? to have it done. Work is due. That's when you have to have it done by. Yes, but when I can start. Whenever you want. Even today? Even today. Oh, wow. Now, I would wait for the quiz review next class, but you it's all ready for you right now. Um, so next is quiz review and the midterm review. Or, or it's different, no. Yeah, the quiz review is for quiz three. The midterm review is for the midterm exam. We uh, check it the next uh, lesson. Next lesson, we're doing the quiz review. We're going to go question and answer. And then Wednesday, your ocean graphs are due. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem. My pleasure. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, everybody. I have, well, I have miscellaneous questions that probably don't really apply to everyone else. So. Well, let's hear them. All right. So, um, do we know why, and, and I might have missed it, do we know why the Earth is split into four systems like that? Like, was it, is it, is it just simplified for the purpose of this course into four with the zero to 30, 30 to 60, or? Um, well, they, we have three, three convection cells. Now, it's just simplified the numbers, but like we saw with the monsoons, it's variable from season to season. Mm -hmm. See, you can't really memorize. Uh, let's let's have a look. You're talking about um, to the three cells. And then there's three mm -hmm. below, so really it's six total. Three global yeah. wind belts above, three global wind belts below. Is this what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, I missed the top one. So what happens is we just give them the even latitude and longitude because on average, that's what they are. But they change seasonally because we're, you know, the warmer trade winds would be wider during the summer, but the westerlies, which are a little cooler, and the easterlies would be wider in the winter. So it's not like fixed perfectly on the 30. I don't know why it made it just shrink. It's not fixed perfectly on the 30. Uh, that's its average. 
Okay. Yeah, it's just very seasonably. All right. And do we know if there's, I know that we went over plate tectonics and how everything's been moving since uh, Pangea. And do we know if there's a reason why right now the, the North Hemisphere has more land? I mean, I know given plate tectonics, that's what makes sense, but it seems I, like the, before this. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the um, planets have been moving and they, they just happen to be broken up in that way now. In the right. past, it hasn't always been that way. Pangea was all together and we've had the, it happen a few times, but right now the Northern Hemisphere is the land hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere is the water hemisphere. More water than land. Gotcha. Um, just, does the other person on this call have any other questions? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe she had to step away, Janisa. Maybe she stepped away. Okay. Um, so I was reading through your biography because it always interests me what, what the professors have and stuff. And I noticed that your title is captain. Can we oh. call captain? I, uh, I, had a, I had a boat, took some classes. And uh, so it's more of a recreational boat captain than like an admiral in the, in the uh, service. Okay. So more of a fishing type, uh, and I was also a dive master and a whole bunch of stuff. So I spent a considerable amount recreating on the sea. And uh, actually, so my captain is now turned in. I passed on my boat to my son-in-law and my daughter. And now I uh, am just regular old uh, professor. Uh, all right. That's okay. We all, uh, I got tired of maintaining all the the effort it takes to write uh, that. Yeah. So that's it. That's the story. Uh, I got old and lazy. Oh, I mean, you know, what, what better story than, than a retired captain who lives by oh, yeah. old and lazy. <laughs> so I also saw that you um, are kind of from New York, seemingly, and that you went to Onondaga Community College. I, I did. I grew up in Liverpool and never saw the ocean until. I was grown. Wow. I I used to um, live in New Jersey and we used to go up around there. What was, oh, what yeah. was that like? Yeah, I uh, learned uh, I, I learned a lot on the Great Lakes and stuff, and I, I got my interest around that. So uh, I actually have a master's in limnology as well, lake study of lakes. Oh. So, uh, and then my uh, oceanography came after that. So it was kind of cool. I, I, I went from lakes to ocean due to where I lived in the uh, program I got accepted to. All right. What, what brought you down to Florida? Uh, well, I uh, was looking for a job and uh, Florida had one. And I was like, OK, I'm in. I, I'll give it a try. And that was uh, almost 30 years ago, 25 years ago. So, uh, yeah, I've really uh, enjoyed it and will be here for the rest of my life. Wow. All right. <clears throat> I also saw that you went to the State of University ESF. That was totally my dream school for a while. I saw that you had a major in environmental science. That was like totally my dream, you know, oh, yeah. down. but how, how was that? What, what's it like? Would you recommend that school? It's the top school in the, probably the world for really? environmental sciences. It is fantastic. They manage the entire Adirondack forests. They have campuses all over the state. They have uh, Arboretums, they, it's just an amazing, amazing school, great research institution. Uh, they co-op with Syracuse University, so they have all the, the campus uh, delights of a big campus, but they're a small campus off to the side, not even part of it. You can take classes through Syracuse as well. If you wanted to, like, say, major in environmental communications, you could take your communications through Syracuse at the discounted rate and all the environmental sciences at uh, the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So really is a fantastic college. Uh, top ranger schools, uh, uh, really, really good college. Very cool. I'm kind of bummed out that I'm so far away now. Do you, do you have anything to say for USF? Because I know USF is like $6,000 a year. and My wife? Are. My daughter uh, and my son is going to go to USF. 
Uh, my daughter actually works for USF as a, in the research department, the medical research department. She's an ARMP for uh, Lou Gehrig's disease patients. Cool. And it is now one of the top 50 public colleges in the country. So USF gets a big thumbs up. They have a nice marine program as well. All right. Um, I, got, I got a lot of good things about USF as well. So yes, it's closer. And it might be an environmental institution, but really for the medical field and the marine biology field, it's top notch. Okay. I swear I only have two more questions. Okay. Um, I saw that you founded um, an environmental club at Seminole Campus. Um, I did uh, several decades ago before, uh, uh, gosh, it was probably in the mm, I don't even remember when it was. Uh, we didn't have an environmental program and uh, they asked me to start an environmental club, handle the campus recycling. And uh, I also helped write the environmental program that they currently have. Uh, when they offered me the lead in the environmental program, though I already had a job, I was the earth science uh, oceanography instructor. So I had to pass because I had a full-time job and a family as well. But yeah, I did start the environmental club. They uh, they run it out of Tarpon Springs now. Uh, I saw that. Kelly Sickrath is the uh, moderator. Uh, she was she was hired on to to run the environmental program that Dr. Oliver and I wrote. It was it was a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah, I was part of a very, very small, well, I was the president of my environmental club in high school that had about four people in it, and it was just me and my friends running around picking up garbage, so, um, but it sucks that they're, they're in Tarpon Springs. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of involved in their things. I, like, deathly afraid of deep water, so all of their kayaking expeditions I've passed on so far, but I'm going to go out with them next weekend, so. It's, it's oh, fun. yeah, you got it. You got to overcome the fear. You'll, you know, wear a life jacket. You'll be okay. I've only kayaked on lakes before. I absolutely love kayaking. Well, I kayaked on the Delaware once, but just, I don't know. I, I, I do want to try it out sometime though. And I also, I work nine to five, so that's not the most conducive no. to- Well, say hi to, to, to Kelly Stickrath for me. All right. Here we go. Totally. All right, last question. I, like many other college students, have absolutely no idea what I want to do. Um, environmental science is super fascinating to me. I took um, oceanography just because it sounded interesting, not really because it coincided with my major or anything, and I'm loving it so far. Do you have any recommendations on where to go? I saw that you also had um, graduate work in meteorology, which is something that I'm really interested in after taking this class, but still no clue. Well, I mean, what do you see yourself doing 10 years from now? And that's the question I never have an answer to. Um, I, I love science. Um, I've always been like, you know, I did the whole STEM program through high school or whatever. Um, I actually uh, spent six years abroad um, studying electrical engineering <laughs> um, before coming back. But it just seems like the way to do any kind of, you know, you know, the climate crisis and all of that. But it seems like the only way to do any kind of real change is to be involved in policy. But it's just so boring to me. So I don't know if that's, yeah, I don't know. Is there a way to make any kind of meaningful change just going into science and not policy? Because right now it seems like the best way of, of doing things is to, you know, have a better system for, for the people and, you know, where were there. I went into environmental communications, and wound up teaching, uh, taught at every level, high school, college, a lot of fun. Uh, very rewarding. I, I, in my heart, in my back of my heart, I kind of wanted to be a forest ranger and drive one of those cool Jeeps. Oh, me too. Uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, that aside, uh, working for the state and fisheries and stuff like that's nice. But generally speaking, you know, it, to make an impact, you're going to have to go into policy or education where you touch the most lives. Uh, yeah. From a purely scientific, uh, you know, research, or uh, like I would work for fish and wildlife myself would be would be how I you, you do it as well. Okay. Have you ever worked for for any kind of uh, government organization? Uh, I have not. No, I've only been with uh, 
I've only, I went the education route. So I've been teaching since 1988. Wow. Oh, that sounds like fun. It has its moments. <laughs> I've heard from most of my teachers that the worst things about teaching are the parents and the politics. Yeah, yeah, that's, that uh, can be frustrating sometimes, but uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I've enjoyed my career. Nice. All right. Well, that's all I had. Uh, sorry for taking up. No problem. No problem. It's always time. nice to uh, to help help a student out, and uh, you have a great day. Thanks. You too. See you Wednesday. Bye now.